What a delight to be with you. My first time to campus was yesterday and just had a whirlwind day. Loved every bit of it. And the best part, meeting the staff, the faculty, and especially the students. What an uplifting community. I mean, you know that. I'm seeing it for the first time close up. And I tell you, I was deeply edified by the experience. So thank you, everybody, for that. Um, can I, before I begin the formal talk, let me tell you one quick little story, and, and you'll like the moral of the story. The very first commencement address I ever heard was in 1980, and it was my brother's graduation from Marquette University in Milwaukee. We were in an arena that was bigger than this one, I mean, probably 10,000 people, huge crowd. Everyone came in, the ceremony began, and then up to the podium came the, key, the commencement speaker, and he was a bishop who had flown all the way in from the Philippines. Marvelous man, by the way, doing great work there. Well, he began his speech, and I'm not joking, at about the 45-minute mark, he said, I could go on and on. <laughs> at which point, the entire arena said, no. <laughs> so I think that was the Holy Spirit's way of saying to me, sitting way up in that crowd, if you're ever a commencement speaker, keep it short, you know. So I will. Uh, as I say, my gratitude to President Minnis and to the whole administration and staff and faculty here. But I'll tell you, for the students, I take this very seriously. So receiving an honorary doctorate today makes me a member of your class. And that's important to me. So fellow graduates, I'm talking to you. And I hope everyone else can perhaps listen in. I'm well aware I'm on Benedictine ground today, a place filled with the mind and spirit of St. Benedict. And I want to share with my fellow graduates some simple rules of life that I think flow from the heart of that great saint. Benedict said a monastery should be a school of the virtues. And clearly the most important virtue for him was humility. The rule famously begins with the word, listen, obsculta. On the biblical reading, our trouble comes from a refusal to attend to the voice of God and a concomitant insistence on listening to ourselves. The key to salvation is a capacity to hear a voice that transcends the ego and its concerns, a voice that calls us beyond our petty preoccupations to the high adventure of the spiritual life. The person who is, in the language of St. Augustine, incurvatus in se, that means caved in on himself, cannot appreciate the realm of objective value, but rather reduces everything to the merely subjectively satisfying. The higher voice summons us to break free of the black hole of our egotism and to come into contact with aesthetic values, with moral values, with epistemic values, all of which are grounded in the God who is supreme goodness, supreme truth, and supreme beauty. Do you see now why St. Thomas Aquinas said simply enough, humilitas veritas. Humility is truth. It gets you in touch with these realities. Young friends, the entire point of your education here was to inculcate in you a sensitivity to these great objective values to teach you what to reverence. And only the humble person can take in such lessons. The roots of our spiritual problem are deep in the modern and postmodern philosophers who've decisively shaped a lot of our cultural assumptions. One thinks perhaps first of Friedrich Nietzsche, who taught that so-called objective values are illusory, that we must move beyond a bourgeois morality of good and evil in the space opened up by that move, the will of the powerful rightly holds sway. This attitude was perpetuated by Jean-Paul Sartre, the founder of existentialism, for whom existence, personal freedom, always precedes essence, who or what one is. Michel Foucault, a disciple of both Nietzsche and Sartre, and perhaps the most influential philosopher on the contemporary scene, held to the non-objectivity of both truth and value, and construed all human affairs as a battle of the powerful against the powerless. Well, what was once bandied about in Parisian coffee houses is now the default position, you know this, of most of your peers in the West. 
Wokeism corresponds very much to this program. But all of it is repugnant to a Christian way of life, which involves a surrender to a will and a voice beyond our own. Here's Benedict from The Rule. I'm quoting, This message of mine is for you then. If you are ready to give up your own will once and for all, and armed with the strong and noble weapons of obedience to do battle for the true King, Christ the Lord. Humility is the virtue that makes this move possible. Just one last point about humility. I've long been struck by the ninth degree of humility that Benedict presents in the rule, perhaps because I'm quite a talker. Here's Benedict. The monk should be reluctant to speak unless asked a question. Consider for a moment how our culture obsessively emphasizes the finding and expressing of one's own voice. Now, there is, of course, something valuable in this, for unjust oppression should always be opposed. However, in the final analysis, it's not what I say that matters, but rather my capacity to listen to what God says. So, brothers and sisters, be humble. Listen. The second Benedictine virtue I want to emphasize is stability. Now, when a monk takes this vow, he's promising literally to stay put to remain in association with his monastery for the rest of his life. This is a particular and radical expression of the virtue. But I think in a wider sense, it can and should be practiced by all of you graduates. I think we can all agree that our culture today is marked by a dramatic instability, born of what St. Benedict called the dictatorship of relativism. If there's only my truth and your truth, but nothing like the truth, if there's only what's good for me, what's good for you, but nothing like what's good in itself, then we drift. We move restlessly from activity to activity, from goal to goal, from lifestyle to lifestyle. We become like the hapless farmer described by Fulton Sheen, planting wheat, then corn, then soybeans, but tearing each crop out of the ground before it comes to fruition. The spiritually stable person knows what she is about, has her life grounded in fundamental and unchanging values, faithfulness to one's spouse, protection of one's children, forgiveness of one's enemies, care for the poor, openness to life, and above all of these, and binding them all together, love, which is willing the good of the other. Properly stable in this spiritual sense, you can wander all over the globe, you can engage in a myriad of activities. You can be as creative as you want to be. But stability is the condition for the possibility. The third Benedictine virtue I'd like to offer for your consideration is work. As everybody knows, the motto of the order is ora et labora, prayer and work. How marvelous, really, that Benedict puts these two activities side by side, implying practically a co-equality or at least a mutual implication. In his great encyclical, Laborum Exercens, St. Pope John Paul II argued that work was part of God's original plan for human beings, for it's an activity that fulfills them and enhances their dignity and engages their powers. We become more human, more ourselves through our work. But when I was coming of age, I heard repeated a thousand times the adage, it's not what you do that matters, but who you are. Now, there's something right in this. For even if all of our activities come to naught, we're still the beloved children of God. Nevertheless, I've always found that distinction a tad overdrawn. For if John Paul II is right, we cannot so neatly separate who we are from what we do. Sigmund Freud is someone with whom I rarely agree. But the founder of psychoanalysis says something I consider very importantly right. When asked the secret to a psychologically healthy life, Freud responded, Liebe und Arbeit, love and work, implying satisfying relationships and satisfying employment. William F. Buckley, the famous political commentator, once said, Industry is the enemy of melancholy meaning that a privileged path out of depression is getting to work. Therefore, my fellow graduates, find something that you love and then do it. 
day in and day out, when you feel like it and you don't feel like it, it will benefit others. It will make you happier. It will give glory to God. Not a bad combination. The fourth and final Benedictine value I, I want to highlight is prayer. May I share a memory with you? Some 36 years ago, I did my pre-ordination retreat at St. Meinrad Arch Abbey in far southern Indiana. I arrived at the monastery late at night after a long drive from Chicago. I rose very early the next day to join the monks at prayer. After stumbling a bit through the unfamiliar landscape on a misty morning, I opened the side door of the Abbey Church and was struck first by the golden light inside. But then I was just overwhelmed by the chanting of the monks. To that point in my life, I had never heard that kind of singing except on records. Keep in mind that liturgical music at that time was more or less four chord folk songs played poorly on guitars. So as they sang, these monks of Meinrad, so harmoniously, so prayerfully, so hauntingly, it was as though a door opened in my soul, a door that, thank God, has never shut again. I distinctly remember saying to myself that morning, I just have to deepen my life of prayer. Of course, I've been praying throughout my life, and especially during my years in the seminary, but the chanting of those monks at St. Meinrad just compelled me to bring things to a new level. Now, I'm sure that many of you graduates here, privileged to live in such close proximity to a monastery, have had experiences similar to that. To pray, as John of Damascus said long ago, is to raise the mind and the heart to God. The Trappist spiritual master Thomas Merton characterized prayer as follows, finding that place in you where you are here and now being created by God. It's quite simply the act of speaking to God and listening to him, conversing with him as with a friend. My sincere hope is that your years here in the shadow of the Abbey Church have effectively opened up the door of prayer and that this door never shuts your whole life long. Fellow graduates, you should pray when you're happy. You should pray when you're depressed. You should pray when you've achieved your greatest success. You should pray when an ambition goes unrealized. You should pray when everyone loves you. You should pray when you become unpopular. There's never a wrong time to pray. The cultivation of your relationship with the Lord must be the top priority of your life, period. Trust me when I tell you, it will sustain you through the vicissitudes of life, through the mountains and valleys that I assure you will come, and that on this day you can barely sense. If you remember one thing that this old bishop told you on the day of your graduation, let it be this, pray without ceasing. So, young friends, be humble. That means be willing to listen to the great voice that drowns out the petty voice of your ego. Be stable, which means rebuke the dictatorship of relativism. Work, which means find something you love to do and then do it with all your heart and for the glory of God. And finally, pray, which means never stop speaking and listening to God your whole life long. Congratulations, everybody, and God bless you.